coming up on the Wednesday edition of Carolina Week. Election results are in. We'll make sure you know your new town leaders. And where is the money you pay in student fees really going? In sports, we'll show you how the women's soccer team is preparing for its 23rd NCAA tournament and a possible 19th national championship. Rob Ellis is here with a look at our Carolina Week four-day forecast. Carolina Week starts right now. From the School of Journalism and Mass Communication at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, this is Carolina Week. Good evening and welcome to the November 9th edition of Carolina Week. I'm Tara Higgerson. And I'm Lydia Garlikov. Tuesday night, Chapel Hill and Carborough residents weren't the only ones waiting for the results of area elections. Reporter Kelsey Richards and reporter Brandon Curry were with some of the candidates as the votes came in. Chapel Hill citizens were at the polls Tuesday to vote for their favorite candidates for mayor and town council. Later Tuesday evening, the lines from the polls switched to lines at the bars. Chapel Hill candidates for town council gathered at the library nighttime establishment, anxiously waiting for the election results. Incumbent Mark Kleinschmidt was hoping to be re-elected so he can continue all of the good work that he says he's done in Chapel Hill in the past four years. I've been very honored to have, been, to have received many comments from people who live here in our community who have told me that they valued my um, my style of leadership. Kleinschmidt had many supporters there to help ease his worries. He just believes in his own principles and I agree with him 100%. Another candidate that was at the bar was 21-year-old Jason Baker. I really just wanted to bring that set of, you know, a, a new diverse viewpoint to the council and, and I thought that uh, student representation would help with that. Baker's campaign manager felt that he was the best candidate for the job. He cares very deeply about the town and I wanted to help him take this next step to try to help with governing. Kleinschmidt was re-elected this year for town council along with Lauren Eastholm, Ed Harrison, and Bill Thorpe. Kevin Foy was also re-elected as mayor. It's his third consecutive term. And in Carborough, what was expected to be a close race for mayor between Alderman Mark Chilton and Alex Zafron was actually a solid win for Chilton. Wearing his trademark straw hat, Chilton waited for the results with family and supporters at Open Eye Cafe in Carborough. Re-elected Alderman John Herrera waited with Chilton, repeatedly checking the results on his Blackberry. Chilton passed the time with his son, who curiously played with Daddy's cigar. Shortly after Zafron called with his concession, Chilton expressed admiration for his opponent. He is uh, one of the smartest people I know and he is a, a courageous fighter for the things he believes in. Chilton also thanked his mother for her unwavering support. She's very proud of her son and added a poignant remark That's about his up. success. I just wish that my husband had lived another year and a half so that he could be here on this occasion. Chilton says he can't wait to get started, but his first task will be replacing himself. Well, I, I think the biggest thing on, on our agenda most immediately, honestly, is uh, that, that we've got to refill my seat because uh, I'm, I'm giving up a seat to become mayor. Kelsey and Brandon join us now to talk more about those election results. Kelsey, we'll start with you. You covered the Chapel Hill elections. Why do you think so many of the candidates were reelected this year? Well, Lydia, Chapel Hill residents seem satisfied with the way things have been going for the past four years. Plus, Mayor Kevin Foy's opponent had lived in Chapel Hill for only four months prior to the election, which might explain Foy's landslide victory. And Brandon, you covered the Carborough elections. The race for mayor was projected to be really close. Why do you think Chilton dominated at the polls? Chilton says it's the personal approach he took to campaigning, out knocking on doors along with members of his family, including his mom. And maybe his straw hat made him look like an average guy, which voters seem to like. Kelsey Richards and Brandon Curry, thanks. A provision in the North Carolina state budget had some state residents concerned about footing the bill for out-of-state students. The measure allows out-of-state students on full scholarships to be considered North Carolina residents for tuition purposes. But some feel this takes away spots at UNC system schools that could go, in, that could go to in-state residents. 
Taxpayers would pay at least part of the measure, and UNC system schools currently have an 18% cap on out-of-state students. Construction at student stores isn't clog is clogging the walkway to another campus hotspot. This bicycle isn't the only thing stuck behind campus construction fences in the pit. The campus coffee shop, The Daily Grind, is also fenced in. To get a cup of coffee from The Daily Grind, you now have to go through the main student store's building. And although some people made it to the shop for lunch, Daily Grind employee Anushka Brode says the construction has many people convinced the coffee shop is closed. I think um, Jay and the owner said we're down like $500 to $600 in sales a day, about. And today is even slower, so it might be even more. Broad says the Daily Grind is directing customers to climb around the construction and walk this path by the UL if they don't mind jumping off a ledge. Drinking at least a cup of coffee a day is actually good for you, at least for women. Contrary to other studies, government-funded research found women who drink more than three cups of coffee a day are up to 12% less likely to develop high blood pressure than women who drink less. That's because coffee has antioxidants, which are substances that protect the heart and reduce the risk of cancer. But the same research shows that people who drink at least four cans of sodas every day increase their risk for high blood pressure. Some university employees need, to help developing, need help developing basic computer skills in order to optimize their career opportunities, and the university is offering a solution. It may be 8.15 in the morning, and these, but these university employees haven't gone to work yet. That's because they're attending a basic clerical skills class. They're learning computer skills needed for an office career within the university. A year ago, the university started to offer loaner laptops to employees trying to improve their computer literacy. Mail Services employee Geraldine Rogers says the class and the laptop loan is helping her move up. It's great. Uh, very good. It's very helpful if you want to learn how to use a computer and you can't go out and buy a new, new computer right away. And then also you can carry it wherever you go. <laughs> Computers will come in more handy for students too, as reading line by line in your textbook could soon be a thing of the past. Amazon has teamed up with book publishers to let customers buy access to either part of or an entire digital book. Users can also upgrade a physical book purchase to include full online access, meaning you wouldn't have to wait for delivery to start reading. Amazon's plan comes as Google faces increasing resistance from publishing companies related to its own book scanning project, Google Print. This week is Senior Service Week. Seniors have been reaching out to the community and doing it right here on campus. Tuesday, UNC seniors got the chance to tutor local kids and teens who are part of an after-school program called Communiversity. This ongoing program is run by UNC student volunteers and is designed to help to give extra guidance and mentoring to those who attend. Through interactive learning, kids learn about character development, history, and culture. This week's seniors were invited to participate as counselors. In keeping service in mind, the university just announced this year's spring commencement speaker. Wendy Kopp is the president and founder of Teach for America. Chancellor Meeser says Kopp is a good fit because in his words, Teach for America embodies the same ideals of public service and equal opportunity through education that are so highly prized here at Carolina. Our students will benefit from hearing a speaker of Wendy Cop's caliber, whose values so closely mirror those of our own campus community. Last year, Carolina ranked third in the number of students who participated in Teach for America. A new program called Boomerang is an attempt to bring suspended students back to the classroom with better attitudes. Instead of sitting at home all day, students will be dropped off here at the Chapel Hill Carborough YMCA. The Y has reserved space for tutoring, and students will be able to get some exercise and to use the Aquatic Center. Family Advocacy Network spokeswoman Cindy Wilkins says the community needs the program. She says it will help suspended students reconnect to school life. And they're so far behind that when they go back in, they don't care whether they pass or not. So we're looking in long term to reducing dropout rates, building resiliency in students and helping them uh, go back to school and succeed with a better attitude. The pilot program will run from January through June at East Chapel Hill High and Smith Middle School. After the test run, it might expand to other schools in the area. Well, in some parts of the Triangle area, residents are facing water woes. But we'll tell you why Orange County officials aren't worried yet. What is that thing?
like somebody's double chin. Must have lost it snacking on fruits and vegetables. Hmm. <clears throat> Somebody's gonna trip on that. Mm -hmm. What do you get when you cross a soprano with a cardiologist? Someone who'll sing their heart out. Just what they're doing at a local community theater. See, the Sopranos Choir and the Cardiologist Hospital contacted their community coalition and started a children's theater. Play the dragon! They knew busy kids are less likely to try drugs. And that's music to everyone's ears. What can your group do? Contact your community coalition at helpyourcommunity.org. Because you get more. When you get together. Carolina Week took an in-depth look at student fees last month. Now we're bringing you an update about how one particular fee is raising some students' eyebrows. Many undergraduate students at Carolina take advantage of on-campus printing, open gym facilities, and seats to cheer on the Tar Heels. But students don't often realize they're paying nearly $1,400 in student fees for these privileges. I don't know what the fees go towards. I don't know what they are. Most students don't mind paying for printing on campus, but they're raising concerns about a $100 increase in the athletics fee that's going to boost coaches' salaries. Increase is going to our Olympic sport programs. Um, we have 28 sports, and only two of those sports generate enough revenue to support that, their program and to help in other areas, and that's football and men's basketball. Martina Ballin is the finance director in the athletics department. She says the fee increase is needed to fund operating costs, facility upkeep, and to make coaches' salaries more competitive within the Atlantic Coast Conference. Many of them were in the bottom third, and it was our, it's our goal to try to get them in the top third, and the student fee increase is, will help out significantly in that area. In order to get that increase, the athletics department had to make a deal. Everything with the UNC logo generates a trademark fee that the university receives. Before the athletics increase, 75% of all trademark revenues went toward merit scholarships. 25% supported athletics. Now, all trademark revenues will support merit scholarships, and athletics gained $1.35 million total in student fees. But it's a trade-off some students, like sophomore Stephanie Voschel, don't quite agree with. I don't know if that's something the students should be paying for. Um, I don't know much about how the, the university budgets, but I mean, I would think that maybe there's somewhere else they could pull that kind of money from. Student Fees Committee member and student body treasurer Deneen Furr says other sources aren't dependable. There is outside funding in terms of, of money donated, but you can't guarantee that. Federal grants can't guarantee those, and those a lot of times have stipulations. For agrees there's a need to improve athletic facilities and boost operating budgets, but she's concerned that the Student Fees Committee got the request at the end of the year. It happened at the last minute, and it seemed like a political ploy. And so we didn't approve of it because we said, wait another year, let us at least look at this before you push it through, but they pushed it through anyway. The athletics department is requesting another $50 per student this year. The student committee on student fees rejected that request and the chancellor's committee couldn't reach an agreement. So now the provost will make the decision. Areas surrounding Chapel Hill were under mandatory water restrictions Wednesday night. Durham, Raleigh and Chatham County have all asked residents to cut unnecessary water usage. Lake levels are dramatically low after many days without rain. Park rangers at Jordan Lake, Chatham County's water source, say this is the second lowest level in the lake's history. Some outer parts of the lake bed are almost completely dry. Orange Water and Sewer Authority spokesman Greg Feller says Chapel Hill and Carbro's reservoirs aren't in danger of drying up thanks to lessons from the past. We learned in the drought of 2002, which was a very severe drought, that it's really important that people develop some practices and routines and habits for water conservation so that when there are water shortages we're well prepared for them. Those practices include limiting lawn watering. Chapel Hill already limits the time of day and day of the week some sprinkler systems can operate. To find out if you're using too much water visit carolinaweek.org. And UNC's groundskeepers aren't facing any water restrictions and their efforts to keep campus green are drawing some attention. The university's groundskeeping department won the top honor given by the Professional Grounds Management Society. The prize recognizes the best maintenance and cultivation practices of landscape programs throughout the country. 
UNC's groundskeepers are recognized for their work on McCulkel Place, Polk Place, and around the Old Well. Students and at least one furry friend took advantage of Wednesday's warm weather to enjoy the award-winning landscape. And for the ninth consecutive year, the Carolina Inn has received Triple A's Four Diamond rating. The Inn is one of only 24 hotels in North Carolina to receive the honor. Only about 1,900 of the more than 57,000 annual inspections in the U.S. result in the Four Diamond rating. The Inn's restaurant, Carolina Crossroads, also received a Four Diamond rating and a Four Star rating from the Mobile Travel Guide. Our own four diamond rated weathercaster, Rob <laughs> Ellis, joins us. It was warm on Wednesday. That's right. I've got all these jackets lined up. When do I get to wear them? I really enjoy the warm weather, but yeah, people are asking, when is the cold weather going to get here? You know, it's November, but it feels more like July. Coming up after the break, I'll tell you if the temperatures will finally fall along with those leaves. jail for a gun crime and your family serves a sentence with you. During the fall, one of the most peaceful places on campus is the Forest Theater. Many great plays are held in this place of serenity. But my favorite times are when nothing at all is going on and the colorful canopy of leaves overhead shelters you from the cares of the world. No one knows the real Carolina like a student. Well, thank you for joining us for Carolina Week Weather. Time now to take a look at your weather headlines. I'm weathercaster Rob Ellis. This week has been beautiful. We saw those, we saw those warm conditions earlier this week. There's changes in store, though, as a cold front approaches our area, and that means the temperatures are going to take a tumble. We're going to see the temperatures drop about 10 degrees from where they're at now as that cold front approaches. And behind that cold front, the wind is going to pick up. It's going to feel much cooler, and it's going to be a little blustery out there. So keep that in mind as you head outdoors Thursday and into Friday. But by the weekend, we should see some clearing. So you'll have those weekend plans outdoors. They look fine, although it's going to be much cooler than we've seen this week. Let's start out with the satellite map and I'll show you what's going on over much of North Carolina and the southeast. We're clear at the moment. So you begin to see that cloudiness move in all throughout the southeast and heading into the uh, of Mississippi River Valley, all that cloudiness is in association with our cold front. And if we go to our surface map, I'll show you where it's located at the moment. This cold front is going to be pushing into our area by Thursday and into Friday, and that's going to give us a chance ahead of the front for some showers and thunderstorms, probably a little farther north. We may not see them as severe here, but there is that chance in the Chapel Hill area for some thunderstorms, and as the front passes through, we're going to see the chance for some showers. So we have that chance for rainfall, and that's very good news because we've been very dry for this year, as you saw in our drought piece earlier. And let's take a look at some of the numbers for Raleigh-Durham Airport. Now here's September, October, and November with our normal and actual that we've seen for September, we saw two degrees below what we normally see in a year. And the same for October, we didn't even get up to an inch of rain for that month. So we're three, um, uh, two inches down there. And for November, we haven't even seen a drop this year. So we're hoping that that doesn't continue. November and October are typically our driest months, so we really desperately need this rainfall. Let's hope we can squeeze some of that rainfall out of this front. Looking at our four-day forecast, though, we'll begin on Friday. The front has passed through and 61, so much cooler than we've seen this week with clear, with clear skies, although as we move into Saturday, those clouds are going to build in. We'll see temperatures come up to 69. Look at our overnight low Friday, though, for that morning as you move out into Saturday morning. It's going to be very uh, chill low overnight, almost freezing. Sunday, we're going to continue with those clouds, 72 degrees for your high, and another system approaches by Monday, so we've put in some rainfall there for you. And if you're heading down to the beach, you should have a nice weekend. Again, temperatures are going to be much cooler than they have been, 64 on Saturday, 68 on Sunday, all through the period, lows overnight, around 48. And let's hop on I-40 and go east to the mountains, and you'll see that our temperatures, same story there, nice conditions, very mild, temperatures in the 60s, but lows overnight, very chilly, 30 degrees 
in the 30s for most of that period. But here in Chapel Hill, it's going to be beautiful for our kickoff at Keenan Stadium at noon, 63 degrees for your temperature at kickoff, and it should be clear, but as the game progresses, I'd expect it to get a little warmer in the day, approaching 70 degrees. So it's going to be beautiful. So it's going to start to feel like fall, hopefully, Robbie? Finally, it will. All right. Thanks, Rob. All right, now Heather Catlin is here with our sports. Last week you said the Heels had to win three out of four. They won one. What are our chances That's for That's right. Next we two? had a big win against Boston College, and some thought it was a surprise win, but uh, we have three more big games to go. So coming up in Carolina Week Sports, the football team still needs two wins to become bowl eligible. We'll show you what the Heels have to do to win the game on Saturday against Maryland in Keenan. Kid was shaking. Besides me. <laughs> Dad, there's something wrong with the fridge. What? Ooh, a snack. <sighs> Got energy hogs in your house? Now you have the power to do something about them. Log on to energyhog.org. Because nobody likes an energy hog. Hey, they got Charlie. Yeah, who cares? <laughs> I'm doing it right now. I do it all over town. I do it every day. We do it in a group. I did it after dinner. You don't have to go to the gym to live a healthier life. Add more fruits and vegetables to your diet. <coughs> Park further away and walk. Walk your dog. Walk with friends. Take the stairs instead of the elevator. They are doing it. And you can too. Start doing it today. Welcome to Carolina Week Sports. I'm Heather Catlin, and this will probably be the only sportscast that won't mention Terrell Owens. Uh, wait. With 18 national championships, it seems like the women's soccer team's regular season is merely a warm-up. Reporter Michael Crow previews Carolina's run at yet another title. Fresh off their 16th ACC tournament championship, the Tar Heels are clicking. Our mentality all over the field has been uh, outstanding. Um, everyone's playing defense. Uh, the team's coming together in every conceivable way, so uh, I'm pretty excited about where we are right now. Carolina's run at a 19th NCAA championship begins Friday against Western Carolina. Senior Casey White has been on a championship team in the past. She says the team needs to raise its level of play to bring home number 19. Our defense that was good in the ACC tournament isn't good enough, you know, and our offense isn't good enough. We can always bring it up to a new level, and I think that's what we're striving to do. The Tar Heels failed to raise their level of play in last year's tournament, falling to Santa Clara in the third round. The team could face a tough ACC matchup in the second round this year against Clemson. Carolina defeated the Tigers 5-1 to one earlier this year. Head coach Anson Dorrance says he doesn't like the potential ACC rematch. Clemson... Uh, uh, is an ACC rival. We never want to see that. So uh, the bracket certainly isn't perfect for us. What is perfect is where Carolina is playing. If the Tar Heels advance, all of their games will be in Chapel Hill until they reach the Final Four. But the team still has a lot of work to do to get there. In Chapel Hill, I'm Michael Crow, Carolina Week Sports. The Tar Heels also had a home field advantage in 2003's national championship season. Carolina takes on the Catamounts of Western Carolina Friday at 5 p.m. Another team looking to make some noise in the postseason is the football team. With the Heels needing two wins for bowl eligibility, the home, the home game against Maryland on Saturday is huge. A year ago, we weren't winning any football games because of our defense. We were able to sometimes hold somebody off. Uh, and we, we're very good on offense. Uh, this year, uh, we've done some better things on defense. We've limited uh, opponents to uh, the rush on occasion. We've uh, limited them to points on occasion. Uh, but we need to get better uh, defensively, and we'll be challenged a, a great deal this week by the University of Maryland and Ralph Ragin and their football program. I think definitely uh, controlling the ball is a big thing for us. Um, one, it gives our defense time to, time to rest. Uh, we definitely have to score more points. Um, we got in the red zone maybe two or three times, and we came up with field goals instead of instead of touchdowns. And uh, like I said last week, three field goals and a touchdown, you know, was enough to win against BC. But it may not be enough to win against Maryland this week. 
Carolina will definitely need more than 16 points against Maryland on Saturday. The last time the two teams met, the Terps hung 59 points on the heels. Game time is at noon. In the second exhibition game of the season, the women's basketball team looks to take on Athens in action. Ivory Lattice starts us off with a dish to Latoya Pringle for an easy two. Head coach Sylvia Hatchell already knows who she wants for this next play. Camilla Little gets on the ball, showing off some defensive skills. This sets up Larkinson's assist to Latoya, Latoya Atkinson for the bucket. Atkinson racked up 10 points on the night. Little isn't the only one with the D. Freshman Rashonda McCant says, I can do it too, and Elena Larkins finishes the shot for the rookie. The Tar Heels trounce athletes in action 80-57. to The Tar Heels drown the Blue Devils at the swimming and diving meet Tuesday night in Coriat Natatorium. Six different Carolina swimmers and divers each won two individual events. The women won 13 of 16 events, while the men took top honors in 14 of 16. Both men and the women are currently ranked 22nd and are both 1-0 in the ACC. Well, guys, after that win, we're still two and a half points behind Duke in the Carlisle Cup points, but we have the football game against Duke in two weeks. That'll get us two points, and then we have the rest of the season uh, and the year to get more points. That's right, and basketball. That's right. You certainly don't want to lose against Duke. Thanks, Heather. Thank Thanks. you. And you don't have to be highly recruited or have world-class athletic ability to play sports at Carolina. That's right. We'll show you a sport that allows you to be a varsity athlete. Hint, hint. It's not basketball. I used to party a lot. I'd black out and not remember anything. My friends would tell me that I needed help. I didn't listen. I was in control. Then something happened. I realized if I didn't stop, I would die. I knew I had to get help. I called the Alcohol Drug Council of North Carolina. They connected me with people who helped me live my life without alcohol and drugs. If your story sounds like mine, then make the call. If you have a story idea, contact Carolina Week at 843-8292. You can also visit us online at carolinaweek.org. If you have questions about this program, write Carolina Week at Campus Box 3365, UNCCH, Chapel Hill, North Carolina, 27599. Many of us, including myself, would have no chance of playing a varsity sport here at Carolina. Lydia, you'd be surprised. Turn it, um, our reporter Tyree Bernadette shows that all you need is some good hand-eye coordination and you could be representing the Tar Heels in competition. There's a sports program here at UNC that turns its walk-ons into Olympians. But it's not as popular as one might think. <laughs> Carolina Finson. Ron Miller has been a coach for 38 years. He says fencing draws on the physical skills from other sports. Wrestling, um, things that require body control like gymnastics or diving, um, football surprisingly, um, defensive backs, things of that nature make excellent fencers. All of these athletes share an important skill essential to fencing, footwork. But what would draw such a variety of athletes to this sport? With fencing, the mental aspect of it takes a larger role, a much larger role, so fencing is probably the only sport I've found that fully challenges me both mentally and physically on a regular basis. Sophomore Joe Pitkin fences primarily Sabre for the team. The Sabre is used to cut an opponent and his bouts rarely last longer than 20 seconds. Now besides the Sabre, there's also the foil and the epee. Now the score with the foil, the point of the blade is driven right into the torso. And the score with the epee, the entire body is a target. Freshman fencer Stephen Loy says the best way to describe his sport is chess at the speed of boxing or chess at 500 miles per hour or something like that. Human chess. And in a 20 second bout, there's no time for a wrong move. In Chapel Hill, I'm Tyree Barnett, Carolina Week Sports. So have you fenced? Uh, I did, actually. My father fenced in, in college, so we have the full fencing attire and the foils and everything. Oh, wow. Why not try out for the team? I, I, don't, I don't think it's for me. It's not a varsity sport, but it's not for me. Have you fenced? I wouldn't. All right. Well, that <laughs> looks like a lot of fun, Lydia. Yes. Maybe, maybe I can convince you at another time. So that's going to do it for this edition of Carolina Week. Have a wonderful evening. Good night.